Why hello there, welcome back to my channel. My name is Lou, if you did not know, and today I'm gonna to be talking about how gender euphoria helped me to figure out my gender. This topic was originally just going to be one part of a longer video I was planning to make about the things I wish I'd known when I started figuring out my gender, but the video was just getting way too long, so I thought I would chunk it up into shorter videos instead. Also, I do just want to say I am aware I have not made a video in many a month. I kept wanting to and I've really missed it, so if you're watching this, we did it guys, I posted. <laughs> I want to make this video because when it comes to content talking about trans and or non-binary issues, there is a massive bias towards talking about gender dysphoria rather than gender euphoria. And this makes sense in loads of ways, right? Gender dysphoria sucks. People want to know if what they're experiencing is dysphoria, they want to know how they can alleviate it, and people want to know if there's anyone else out there who can relate to the way they're feeling. In this content, euphoria is often framed as the thing you can get to once you've figured out how to reduce your dysphoria, and on top of this, this, dysphoria is usually signposted as the biggest and most important sign that you are not cisgender. But can it be any other way? What about the experience of figuring out parts of your gender through euphoria rather than dysphoria? What about finding things that make you euphoric and only then having your dysphoria become clear to you? Can figuring out your gender identity be more about moving towards comfort than moving away from discomfort? In this video, I just want to share part of my story to illustrate the different ways that gender dysphoria and euphoria can relate to each other. I've spoken to a couple of people who relate to the way I've experienced things, and so I just thought I'd put this video out here in case there's anybody else who's ever felt slightly alienated from the way we're taught about euphoria and dysphoria. I want to preface this by saying that the way you experience dysphoria, how intense it is, and when it began in your life does not determine how trans and or non-binary you are. Some people will experience intense chronic dysphoria and for some it'll be far milder or more fluctuating and many will fall somewhere in between. All of this is okay and the idea that you need a particular kind or amount or intensity or pattern of dysphoria in order to be really not cisgender is an unhelpful narrative that was created and continues to be perpetuated by the medical community. Woo! <laughs> But with that in mind, I hope it goes without saying that the experiences of people who have chronic, intense dysphoria and the needs they have are really important topics and should get the attention they deserve. My purpose for making this video is just sharing a lesser spoken about perspective in the hopes of reaching anybody who feels similarly. If you've never seen my face before, why hello there, my name is Lou, I drink coffee and I talk about things, so please subscribe down below for more of this. I think the best way for me to explain this is to tell you a little story from my journey. A voyage into Lou's gender mind palace, if you will. I started questioning my gender in earnest in autumn of 2020, aged 19. Aside from maybe two panicked chaos thoughts earlier in my teens, which I quickly suppressed, I hadn't really thought about my gender up until this point. Because I'd always presented very femme and I'd never been stereotypically gender non-conforming, I had always just assumed that I must be cis. It was actually a class at university that sent me spiralling about my gender, which I still find hilarious, and you can hear a little bit more about that in this video, but I think because I had so strongly assumed that I must be cisgender because I wasn't exhibiting any of the stereotypically not cis traits, it took an outside removed perspective and information for me to really start interrogating my own gender, and I suppose that's what this module gave me, right? It gave me a theoretical, academic understanding of gender, which then got me thinking, hmm, how might this play out for me? <laughs> It's almost like learning about gender in the abstract allowed me to finally give myself permission to explore it personally. I found myself with this overwhelming sense that I'd never had before, that I was actually allowed to try something else, that the gender I'd been given wasn't compulsory, and that the way I'd been in my gendered life so far didn't mean I wasn't allowed to explore it now, that someone like me was allowed to explore this part of themselves. And I got the sense that just maybe there might be more happiness, comfort and authenticity waiting for me on the other side of this endless mass of confusion. <laughs> and I was right, so I mean, I guess the endless mass of confusion paid off. <laughs> 
So as I spent more and more time lurking on the non-binary subreddit, and one of you actually found me on there, someone spotted me on the non-binary subreddit off of YouTube and messaged me, so shout out if you're watching, please comment and say hello. But as I spent more and more time lurking in online spaces for non-binary people and absorbing all the information I could about what it meant to be non-binary, I started playing with my expression a little bit. At first it was just more masculine leaning clothes to kind of dip my toe in the water, then I tried out they them, which stuck. I cut my hair, which clearly stuck, it's only getting shorter, <laughs> and I started binding. And this is where I can illustrate my slightly back to front dysphoria euphoria experience. Before I started questioning my gender and before I tried binding, I wouldn't say I was dysphoric about my chest in any clear cut linear way. Now I can certainly remember a bunch of funky emotions from puberty and from throughout the rest of my teens, but it doesn't really resemble that kind of textbook dysphoria that we hear about. But when I first wrestled my way into a binder, I felt so euphoric, and I still get a version of that feeling every time I choose to bind now. A feeling of rightness, of seeing yourself more fully, and of embodying yourself in a different way. And having found that euphoria by trying something new, largely out of curiosity, it became clear to me the dysphoria that I experience when I'm not binding. The way I describe it is that binding feels right, and not binding doesn't necessarily feel wrong, but it definitely feels less right, if that makes sense. <laughs> My pronouns are an even clearer way for me to explain this, so I tried they them out of a sense of feeling generally scrambled about my gender and just wanting to see if they'd work. She, her didn't hurt before, but once I tried they them, they came to fit me so well and make me feel so comfortable that by comparison to that new euphoria, when someone uses she, her for me now, it definitely does make me feel dysphoric. Both of these get at the point that I'm trying to make that exploring your gender can sometimes be as much about moving towards comfort than it is about moving away from discomfort. And your dysphoria, however you experience it, can sometimes only really become clear to you after you find the alternative that makes you feel better. Now, contrary to the nagging voice of imposter syndrome that plagued me for the first few months of figuring out my gender, this does not mean that you have given yourself dysphoria. It does not mean that you're making it up or that you're somehow so desperate to be trans and non-binary that you've convinced yourself that you're experiencing dysphoria. Rather than being a sign that you're actually a sneaky gender imposter, it actually makes total sense. So many people have gender-related aha moments where something just clicks in their mind by total accident, whether that be borrowing a friend's clothes, playing a character in a play, or somebody just stumbling over their words and using different gendered language for you. The way you figured it out doesn't determine how real or true it is, it's just a part of how you got there. While writing this video, I thought a little analogy might help to make sense of what I'm saying here. It is about cooking, but I promise it makes sense, so just stick with me. <laughs> Imagine you don't know how to cook. You don't mind cooking, and you don't necessarily dislike the food you make, but it's nothing special, and it's not something you particularly enjoy. Until one day, your friend invites you around for dinner, and they've prepared the most amazing meal. It tastes so good, you are blown away, and you can't believe they've possibly conjured up something so incredible. So after the meal, you head home, and when the next meal time rolls around, you cook for yourself like you normally would. Except now, by comparison, your cooking kind of sucks, so you get in touch with your friend right away and ask for the recipe, and they give you the whole cookbook, and you get really into it. Suddenly you're preparing these new meals that really excite you and make you feel really happy, and you realise that somebody like you can try new things, and can figure out how to cook. Would you tell this person that they didn't really like the new food, or that they didn't really care about cooking just because they hadn't hated the way it had been before, or because they'd stumbled into it? You probably wouldn't, right? I mean, I'd probably ask them to invite me around for dinner. <laughs> The point I wanted to make through that analogy is to say that just because somebody realised their gender identity through finding things that make them euphoric, whether that's out of curiosity, through confusion, or even by chance, that doesn't make their gender any less real or true. And if finding that euphoria makes the alternative, makes the old way of living feel dysphoric, that dysphoria is also real, and we shouldn't trust a person's feelings about themselves any less just because of the way their euphoria and dysphoria relate to each other. Just like many of us trans and non-binary people, I have felt a lot of imposter syndrome about my gender, and it's not completely gone away, and a large part of that was because of how I figured it out. And I also would get frustrated 
with myself in moments of being particularly confused or feeling really isolated and lost with how I was feeling, I'd get frustrated with myself because I felt like if only I hadn't pursued that, that need I had to figure this out, to unpack it all, I could have just continued how I was before and I could have saved everybody and myself a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> and I still get that feeling sometimes, especially when I'm being misgendered a lot or I'm around people who don't really see me. I get the sense that I could have just saved everybody a lot of hassle if I'd never even tried to unpack how I felt about my gender. But despite the fact that those doomy gloomy thoughts still sometimes make their way into my mind, I know that when I really sit down and check in with myself, I would not take any of it back. All the things I've tried, the things I've explored, the things I've changed about the way that I live in my body, the way that I live my life, I would not take any of it back for the world because ultimately I am non-binary and the more I embrace that and accept that, the more I feel like myself. And if I hadn't built up the courage in those first few months filled with anxiety and confusion to finally seek out those first moments of gender euphoria, I don't know how long it would have taken me to get here. Whew, okay, we are taking a sip, folks. Even though it's 6.04 in the evening. I really hope you enjoyed this little exploration of Euphoria and that you got something out of hearing part of my story. I have loads of videos kind of similar to this, all to do with something that I wish I'd known or had been told when I was figuring out my gender in the first place. So please do comment down below if you'd like to see more videos like this, or if there are any kind of life lessons you wish you'd known. See if we can kind of be like, hey, we can be like two Spider-Mans in the comments being like, gender. <laughs> Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm also very grateful to anybody who's subscribed during the long barren months where I have not been posting at all. I really appreciate it. And I'm also very grateful to everybody who takes the time to send me a lovely DM on Instagram. I am private at the minute, so I'm not gonna say follow me. However, if you want to ever message me, then my Instagram handle is at it's Tallulagard and you can pop me a line on there if you ever want to say hello. I'm sending you all lots of love and I will see you very soon. Bye!